Hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Jeremy and it's my privilege to be a part of the team here at Journey. And I'm glad that you're here, especially if you're here for the first time or two. I know that when you come into a new room or you're joining us online, you're, you've got questions about this group of people. And I want you to know we have questions about them too. But what I want you to know more than anything else is that this is not a group of people that used to be people like you. And we're not a group of people who just put up with or just tolerate people like you. And we're not a group of people who try to fix or change people like you. Because this is a group of people just like you. Every single person in this room that's, uh, that's joining with us either in person or online, every one of us have parts of our story that we wish we could do over. Parts of our story that we wish we could edit or change. There are parts of my story that I wish we could delete and forget they ever happened. But the reality is that another thing that's true about every one of us is that we all have problems. Life is full of problems, isn't it? It seems like it seems like one thing after another. And some of those problems seem like insurmountable, right? If, it, if it's not the you know, relational problem, it's a money problem. If it's not a money problem, it's a work problem. If it's not a work problem, it's a, it's a vehicle problem or a house maintenance problem or a, or a kid problem, a parenting thing. I mean, like problems are part of every one of our lives. And it's Mother's Day, right? Of, of all the days, we are graced and blessed with the presence of moms in our lives here with us today, who, but they know firsthand what problems are like, right? I mean, the whole idea of birthing a child problems, right? Then you have the child, and it seems like as soon as you have kids, it seems like as moms, you, you already begin to compare your kids with other kids. Problems, right? And then one kid develops faster or different in a certain area than another, and then moms feel like it's your fault, and it's not. But the problems just mount, right? And they just seem to get overwhelming the amount of time that you don't have by yourself while they're little. And then you have this learning to talk thing, more problems, right? There, it, it, everything about raising kids are, is problematic. Their attitudes, then they learn to drive, then they move out and go all off on their own. And then you're left holding the bag of like, what's my purpose, what's my identity? It's one problem after another, and all of it's a joy and a blessing, except for the parts that aren't, right? Like, and the truth of it is that problems come with it. And I'd be remiss if I didn't even mention this today, that the idea of motherhood is a challenge and a problem even in and of itself for some of us. I mean, the idea of how many of our family here at Journey have lost a child to a miscarriage, lost a child to some sickness or an accident, lost a child to the idea that of infertility, couldn't, couldn't be able to, to, to be blessed by that part of life. But can I just say this to you, that if you're here today and that's been your story, you've struggled with infertility, with, with, with struggle like that, all those stories in and around motherhood, can I just say this? I am so, so thankful, blessed, proud of you for being here today because you knew that today was going to be painful. And I'll promise you this, I'm going to try my very best to not make this a complicated thing. But we all have problems that just seems like they're constantly inundating us, aren't they? It makes the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount pretty poignant. He says, so don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Man, that's, that's valuable, isn't it? Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to have its own issues. Today's got enough problems of its own. And here's the bottom line of this series, and I just ask you to do this. Would you stop for just a minute and consider or think about your biggest problems, the biggest problems that you're facing right now? And I know that your problems, if they're anything like mine, sometimes they feel insurmountable. They feel overwhelming. But can I just tell you that, that this, this truth of this whole idea of, of what the gospel is about is that Jesus has a special place in his heart for people with problems. Now listen, if you have no problems, Jesus has a special place in his heart for you too. But the truth is that there's, the gospel is uniquely crafted for people like you and I, whose problems seem insurmountable. But when we dive into or lean into what God has to say in the Sermon on the Mount, it challenges some things in us. 
And it challenges some things in us and it helps us to realize that while we may feel like our problems are insurmountable, it's not our problems that are insurmountable. It's not our circumstances that are insurmountable. It's not the issues we face that are insurmountable. It is the love of God uniquely and personally present in my life that is insurmountable. There is nothing that can separate me from the love that, it, that Jesus has for me and what he wants to do in my life. And it's such a profound and important thing that it means that I have to learn to do something and understand something. It's what we've been talking about during this series, that the quality and direction of your life will be, term, will de be determined by your GPA. Now, it's not your grade point average. That's the best news of the good news. But the quality and de direction of your life will be determined by the general prevailing assumptions that you make, that I make, right? About what is a good person? How do I become a good person? What is real and reliable in this world? We all make assumptions about those things. And when we make those assumptions, we operate based on those assumptions, don't we? Happens in every one of our lives. When you make an assumption, what happens? You begin to not only assume that that information is true, you begin to operate like that information is true. And here's the question. What if your general prevailing assumption is that your problems are what's insurmountable? And you begin to operate like your problems are insurmountable when, without ever realizing or recognizing or challenging the general prevailing assumption that it's not your problems that are insurmountable. It's the love of God uniquely and personally present in your life and in mine. That is what's insurmountable. Think about how challenging that assumption makes a difference. And I just want you to understand something like we're walking into this Sermon on the Mount because Jesus steps into this story with literally the most quoted, most debated, most, most uh, impactful, most talked about speech in the history of mankind. And he says it in a way directly to us. What's crazy about it is this talk that Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount has impacted world leaders. It's impacted politicians. It's in impacted policy and the greatest thinkers of all time. But even more importantly, it has impacted regular people like us. Regular, everyday, average people. The Sermon on the Mount was never intended to, to set up a new standard of living, a new set of rules in addition to the old set of rules. It was never intended by Jesus to say, you've got the law, let me give you some more rules to put on top of it. That's what we tend to do. We tend to go, oh, well, I've got some more things to try and live up to. In fact, if I were being honest with you, it's one of those things that has been a challenge for me. A challenge for me because it, like, sometimes we look at it like this. You've heard the law that says that punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. I read this to you last week. But I say, do not resist even, even resist an evil person. You see, there's a tendency to think that he's going, okay, take the old law and then add this. Don't, look, don't resist an evil person. Someone slaps you on the right cheek or from the other cheek also. Well, another rule, right? We tend to think of it like if you're sued in a court and your shirt is taken from you, you have to give them your coat too. And what he's not doing here is giving us a standard of living. He's not giving us a new set of rules to put on top of the old set of the rules. What he's doing is challenging our general prevailing assumption about where goodness comes from about what is a good person, and about what's real and dependable, about the real life li lives that we live. And so when he unpacks all of this, he's casting a vision for the most important part of all of the Sermon on the Mount. And it starts off with it. It starts off with it when he says, blessed are those who blank. All through what we call the Beatitudes. He starts off in the very beginning of the chapter saying, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit and they recognize their need for God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are these people. He tends to tell us this. But sometimes we so quickly read over that first word, blessed, blessed, blessing. In fact, you know what I, what's crazy is for 51 years of my life, I've always heard the word the Beatitudes. And I just figured it was a, attitude that was supposed to be in my life. I don't know. I, did, I just assumed, right? And once you start with an assumption, you operate with an assumption, right? So I thought beatitude was like, these are the attitudes that should be in your life. And that's not 
what a beatitude is. So I looked it up. This week, I looked it up, and I found out this is what's crazy about it. The word beatitude comes from a Latin phrase. I have no idea how to say that, okay? Because I, I don't understand it, but it came from the Latin Vulgate. The word beatitude is written out this way, and it means supreme blessedness. Do you, do you understand what that means? That God wants to give us supreme blessings. So when he pronounces a beatitude, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, he's saying supreme blessing is on those people. Now let's just get something. He's not setting up a new standard of living. He's not putting more rules on top of the old rules. What he's saying is that, guys, life in the kingdom of Jesus that's uniquely and personally available to you in real time in your real life. Life inside of the kingdom of Jesus, under the lordship of Jesus, life with God is supreme blessedness. That's, that's powerful. That is so much better than the religious noise that I've been given my whole life, right? The religious noise of do more, accomplish more, make sure you do these things, and just don't do those things right? The yeses and nos, the lifeless religious expression of just going through the motions and doing the right stuff just because you feel like you should or you ought to or you're important to, right? Or the idea that somehow or another that I could live up to earn God's love for me or at least repay it. That idea is empty and heartless. And what God wants for our life is this. God doesn't want from us, performance. He wants for us supreme blessing. That's what his hope is. It's why he starts off in those beatitudes, in those supreme blessings to say that supreme blessing, right, are those, are available to those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are those who are poor in in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the people who recognize that they don't have it, right? They don't have it all together. Blessed are the people who recognize their own poverty. Now, can I just mention this? I mean, for us to really understand what Jesus meant here, we have to understand what the people he was talking to would have understood a little bit about. And this word poor would have really pushed a button because the people that he was talking to were generally poor. There were a pretty stark contrast between the haves and the have-nots then. The idea of a middle class did not exist. There were the upper class and then the other people, right? There were the people that had it and the rest of the people who didn't. And the religious leaders of the law, the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law, they had established a general prevailing assumption when it came to riches and poor, right? To the rich and the poor. They had established an assumption that was completely wrong. That here's what the assumption was. That if you did good things, God would bless you. If, you, if God blessed you, you were close to him. And if you were close to him, you got to spend all of eternity with him. Blessed are the rich because they've done good things, gotten close to God and gotten his blessings. And now they'll spend eternity closer to God than the rest of you. And here's the other side of it is if you were poor, you were poor for a reason. You must have done something. If you were sick, you were sick for a reason. It's the reason why the Pharisees asked Jesus, hey, is this man... Was it his sin or his parents' sin that made him sick like this? They had established a general prevailing assumption that poverty and riches, that sickness and health were all related to what you did in life. Now listen, I'm guessing anything. You can just, you can identify that same kind of path of belief or that same kind of general assumption in our lives, right? You get sick, you go, Why, what did I do? Why me, God, right? Well, you, get, you, you have a, a financial struggle. You're like, hey, what? but what didn't I do this? If we try to justify ourselves before God, but he's, what he's saying is he's challenging the general prevailing assumption in our life that poverty and riches and sickness and health are tied somehow to our merit. And what's so valuable here is he says to the poor that blessed are the poor in spirit. The ones who get the supreme blessing are the people who recognize their own poverty of spirit. For theirs isn't just a little bit of blessing in this world. It's not just a little extra stuff. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we choose to see our problems in the context of what's really true, we recognize something that's going on here, that he's saying this to them. And what's crazy about it is much better, much easier than we get it. Anybody gets it when they don't look at it through religious lenses. When we look at it through religious lenses, we're like, oh, we're trying to figure out what our supposed to preach, what our supposed to teach is, right? But when other people look at it, they get it naturally. In 1966, which, yes, is way before my time, right? In 1966, uh, Simon and Garfunkel had a song called Blessed, and they talked about this. They said, blessed are the sat upon, spat upon, and ratted on. You see, they didn't look at that passage through the religious lenses. They saw it the way that Jesus meant it. Blessed are the sat upon, spat upon, and ratted on. Really, if you think about it, whenever you go through problems, what is the first thing you can recognize? You can recognize that God might be the only option you have. When we're sat upon, spat upon, and ratted on, right? When we're down and out, instead of up and out, right? When we're down and out and we're struggling, we have a tendency to be able to see God at work in the middle of our problems. I shared with you a little bit last week about some of the things that I've been going through. And I've got to be honest with you, there's, it's been overwhelming at times. At times it's been overwhelming by the support and care from people, right? At times it's been overwhelming to think this has been going on or that's been going on behind the scenes. At times it's overwhelming to think of, to deal with the unknown. Just consider your problems, what's going on in your life right now in real time. When you're in the middle of that and you get that like, that knot in your stomach, isn't it bring you to a place where you recognize that you don't have what it takes to make it through this one, that you need something bigger, that God could somehow step in and bring my problems under the kingship of Jesus. If I could bring the kingdom of Jesus over my, uh, over my problems, then I could recognize that King Jesus can solve anything he wants to solve. And blessed are the sat upon, spat upon, and the ratted on, because that's, that's me. So let me just invite you to do this. And I know this isn't normal for us. We don't like to think about our problems. We like to avoid them, don't we? But can I ask you this question? Where is the potential in your problem? Like, where is the potential for God to show up when there is no other option? And we don't have to exhaust all of our options before we get to that place. We can start by saying, God, I want to challenge the general prevailing assumption that I have something to offer because that's what I want to do, isn't it? I always want to offer my strength. I want to offer my input, my thing. And I go, hey, God, I'll let you know if I need you, but thanks for the offer, right? What if we started that way? What if we saw problems in front of us and said, God, I am not defending myself. You are my defender. God, I am not providing for myself because you are the provider. God, I'm not going to try and heal myself because you are the healer. I'm going to choose to live in the kingdom of Jesus in my life because it's uniquely and personally available to me. And I want to live in it because that is where all of the power and the potential in my problems really are. So ask yourself this, where is the potential in your problem, the potential for God to show up and show out. Like he's, like he's just showing up to show everybody exactly how powerful he is. Figure out where that is. Lean into it. Here's the next one. It says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That's a pretty, uh, pretty interesting statement. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. But is it true that, like, should we mourn more so that we can be comforted more? Should we look for something to lose so that we can, so God can show up and comfort us? No, that's ridiculous, right? He's not setting up a new standard of living for us that goes on top of the old standard. He's saying, listen, when you choose to bring your mourning and your grief under the Lordship of Jesus, when you choose to live in mourning inside of the kingdom of Jesus, something profound could happen in your life. You will find real comfort. Now, I don't know about you, but um, when I have gone through grieving, um, the natural tendency is just to try and distract ourselves, isn't it? 
we'd try to laugh about something, tell some old stories, you know, laugh about something or, or go out and get your mind off of it for a minute. You know, you go through all the kind of closure sort of things, funerals and viewings and gravesides and things like that, but you try to get through all of it, right? And we ignore and override most of the time. But what we don't normally do is find supreme comfort. Blessed are those who mourn in the kingdom of Jesus because they'll find comfort. They won't find the ignore and override. And what if it's not just about death? What if you're grieving loss or betrayal? What if you're grieving Mother's Day, infertility, the loss of a child? What if you're grieving something that you're like, I just, I just feel alone in this. When we choose to mourn or bring that difficulty and do it in the presence of King Jesus, that's where we find comfort. Supreme blessing. Blessed are those who mourn in Jesus, for they'll be comforted. So let me just ask you this question. Where's the promise in your pain? Like when you, when we're doing, I'm not just talking about filling in some gaps with information here. Where are the places in your pain right now, in the mourning, in the sorrow, in the, in the disappointment with life? And when you're looking for something to depend on, how are you holding on to something that will, fl- that will fly away? And where can you instead hold on to the promises that God has for you? When we choose to mourn or grieve under the Lordship of Jesus, the potential of our lives changes. Can I just tell you this? I'm not just talking to you about some religious thing. I'm talking about you a way to live a better life, the life that is more. That's exactly what you've been invited into, a more life where your pain doesn't have to be without purpose. It could be with promise instead. So what, where is the promise in your pain? Consider your grief, all of it. I know the natural tendency is to push it away. The natural tendency is to try not to think about it, to ignore and override. But think about your grief. Where is the promise that Jesus wants to fulfill in the middle of the pain? If you don't consider the pain, you'll never be able to see the promise. The next um, couple of Beatitudes, I think, go together because they're interesting. Blessed are the meek. For they'll inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they'll obtain mercy. You know what I have always thought of meek people as weak people? I mean, I I told you last week some of the challenges I have with my own ego and my own, my own like bravado, all that kind of stuff. And I've always thought of meekness as weakness, but it's not. What he's talking about here when he challenges this general prevailing assumption is that the meek don't get stuff because they don't take stuff. That's the general idea. I'm always thinking like if you're so meek, you're like, I don't know, is it really mine to take? And is that, I think that the meek sometimes don't have because they don't take. But what he's challenging is that in me. That in me that says that the meek don't have because they don't take. He's like, listen, blessed are the meek. They'll inherit the earth. They'll get it all. And blessed are the people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. There are some of us that cry out for justice naturally. And that might be some of what it's talking about here. But what about the people who've been wronged? What about the people who, who've had wrong done to them? They've been betrayed. Maybe you're in this room and you're thinking, man, my pain right now is betrayal or isolation or rejection. And there's a part of you that sounds that's crying out for vindication. There's a part of you that hungers and thirsts for the righteousness of, of, this, of this situation to be made known, right? Part of you, maybe you've been falsely accused. And there's a part of you inside that just cries out for justice to be known. But can we just say this? When we cry out for justice and we bring that under the lordship of Jesus then we're not crying out for revenge, just crying out that God would work out his perfect plan, which is uniquely and personally available to me as long as I live my life under the kingship of Jesus. 
There is more for my life than, than meekness and grabbing something, or there's more for my life than just wanting vindication or revenge. There's more for my life than just simply exacting, getting my pound of flesh, because blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. I don't know about you, but man, those are profound words for us. So let me just ask you this question. Where is God making it right when you've been wronged? Where is God making it right where you've been wrong? And here's the question, if you're like, he's not. Maybe, and I'm not trying to point a finger, but maybe it's because you're trying to make it right. And that if you're trying to make it right, and you're doing all the wanting, if you're being your own defender, how can God ever be your defender? Where is God making it right when you've been wronged? It's a question only you can really answer. Where is God making it right when you've been wrong? Here's the bottom line for the series. I want you to, again, consider your biggest problems, the biggest struggles that you face, and they sometimes seem insurmountable, don't they? And if it feels like they're insurmountable to you, I want you to hear this that the love of Jesus fully and present in you is exactly what is insurmountable in your life. It's not your problems or your situation that is insurmountable. It's the love of God uniquely and personally present in your life. And that's the good news of the gospel, that Jesus has a, a special place in his heart for people with problems. And maybe you don't have problems. Don't worry. Jesus has a special place in his heart for you too. But he has a unique place in his heart for people with problems, for people that seem to be, by the world's definition, out of the reach of good news. Jesus is particularly close to you in your problems. And his love and his power, fully present and realized in the middle of your pain, your problems, in the middle of your being wronged, Jesus wants to bring those, that power to bear. He wants to show up and show out in a way only he can so that you and everybody else around you can see that it's not your problems. It's not your situation that's insurmountable. It's his love and his power and his presence uniquely available to you in your life today. That is what's insurmountable.